professors who are online to uh, the new semester at the Center for Philosophy of Science. It's the first lunchtime uh, talk. Before uh, telling you a bit about the semester, I wanted to um, 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 introduce the new uh, fellows at the center, as well as the returning fellows, most of whom are here, not everyone. I just saw Hugh and running away. <laughs> but uh, let's start with uh, Douglas, who is... Uh, <laughs> It's you know it's it's because of this stupid piece of paper. <laughs> Second time I'm making the same mistake. Beginning of the semester, first time. Heather, <laughs> who is Heather Douglas, who is a senior visiting fellow, and sorry, and who is uh, returning. Uh, thanks, Sherife uh, Tekin, who uh, will be uh, visiting us for the whole semester. Leonardo uh, Birch, who uh, is right there, and who also will be uh, visiting us for the whole semester. Uh, Laura Menati also, who is uh, right there and also will be with us for the whole semester. Ruth Kessner, who is in the back as well, and we also will be uh, uh, with us. Eugene Fisher, who is right there and who will be with us for the whole semester. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot, Ethan. And, uh, and we also have uh, our uh, returning uh, uh, postdoc, Edding Mosini, who is uh, right there uh, with us. And uh, 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 Ravit uh, uh, is unfortunately not with us uh, yet. She got COVID and hopefully she'll be back with us very soon. All right, that was the first thing. And again, welcome to the fellows. And uh, I hope we'll have a fruitful and exciting uh, semester. The second thing is that since we have a few new people, let me remind you of a few uh, uh, of some of the rules of the talks. The masks are uh, required during the whole talk. We ask you to refrain from eating, but of course you can drink and refresh yourself if you uh, need. We're trying to do some contact tracing, even so I know most of you, so it's not absolutely needed. But uh, please, particularly if you're not a fellow, um, just write your name on the piece of paper outside in case there's a case of COVID and we can send you an email to let you know you've been um, exposed. Um, before uh, moving on to the talk, uh, I have two announcements to uh, make. On a Friday, we'll have a second lunchtime talk at 12.10 as usual. And Caspar Jacobs, who is a postdoc in uh, the Department of History and Philosophy of Science at Pitt, and has been working with David, is that, is that right? Uh, we'll be talking on our mass scaling symmetries of Newtonian mechanics at 12.10 uh, in person. And I invite you to, uh, to join us for this talk. And uh, next week, we have our first talk online. We're going to welcome back a former fellow, Nathalie Weinberger, who is going to uh, join us at 12.10 on Zoom to uh, talk about his uh, recent work. And I'm uh, also inviting her inviting all of you to join us for uh, this uh, uh, lecture by uh, Naftali. One more thing I wanted to mention about the mechanics is we start 12.10 since we're not allowed to eat in this room. There's always food out there that we put around 10.30, 10.45. Please help yourself. It's literally for, uh, for, for you. So just take as much as you want uh, or as little as you want. Um, it's really just for you. All right. Now, um, as you, as most, some of you know, the tradition is that Nick Reschers gives the first talk of the semester. And Nick was actually scheduled to give the first talk of the semester, but uh, told us about two weeks ago that he didn't feel like giving it because of uh, the COVID, COVID um, uh, situation. And so we postponed his talk to uh, February, I think February 1st, something like that. And foolishly, I don't know what to, but whatever my message, well, I'll give a talk. <laughs> I, was, I was somehow reading some stuff, which was sort of annoying me at the time. And I said, I'll give a talk on that. Uh, and it was very foolish because it's, I didn't have a paper. Uh, it was a knee jerk reaction to, uh, to some of the, to the occasion. So I had to put together uh, this um, uh, talk. Uh, so uh, um, that's a little bit of a, uh, I should have learned by my mistakes by now. I'm like, I've been in this job for 20 years. <laughs> you know, you don't give a talk when you don't have a paper written. But in any case, uh, this talk is going to be a bit an unusual talk. It's a talk in metaphilosophy. It's a talk about how to do philosophy of science or how not to do philosophy of science and about some shortcomings that I feel are um, hurting 
one of the most interesting developments in recent philosophy of science. So that's going to be the theme of, of the talk. It's a first pass at what might become a paper one day, or if you convince me that it's not worth it, uh, it's going to be a one off. And anyway, I'll just stop there. I'll bury the topic. All right. It's also a bit of a strange situation because I'm going to be criticizing friends. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really going to be talking about people, uh, some of whom are actually good friends, people are, many people I actually like, and actually many people I really admire. So it's a little bit of a strange situation where, um, and I don't want, in a sense, the critical comments I will make in some, in some of the slides that are going to come to be misinterpreted. These are people whose work I really admire, and I think they've done a, an important contribution to the philosophy of, of science. So what, is going to, what am I going to be talking about? I'm going to be talking about what I take to be one of the most interesting and significant developments in recent philosophy of science. And by recent philosophy of science, I roughly mean the last 20 years of philosophy of, of science. The appearance or the development of formal models to understand some aspects of some features of science that are of philosophical interest. So what I call the formal uh, revolution. I take that to be um, the most significant, probably the most important development in philosophy of science of the last uh, 20 years. So I'm actually, you know, I'm actually very sympathetic to this way of uh, doing uh, philosophy. And I just here gave you a, a few uh, papers which I literally took randomly. You know, friends of mine, Kevin Zolman and Anna Rubin, who was a fellow uh, uh, last uh, semester, and I really enjoy uh, talking to a Max Schneider, who was a postdoc as a fellow last uh, semester, and uh, Kelling and, and, and Jim, who also are uh, uh, friends. Um, I actually took, took them intentionally. To, that's what people who I really like and admire, and I, I, I love to work with, with them. And I, and I think there was a lot of excitement and there is still a lot of ex some excitement about the idea that we can learn things about science by providing formal models of uh, those phenomena. However, there's also a sense that this tradition is not really bearing the fruits that it, it, it seems it could have been buried. There's something, um, uh, something that seems to be unsatisfying in the current development of this uh, formal revolution. Um, I have a slide that I'm, I moved to the end of this talk, but I think I can mention, here, mention it here. It's a, there's a sense that there's kind of a pepper mill that has been growing about this tradition. Um, more and more models about more and more phenomena are actually produced uh, one after the other. And, and uh, sometimes you feel that the game seems to be producing another model of another phenomenon or another model of the same phenomenon. A diagnosis about, about uh, what might be explaining my frustration and maybe the frustration of others is that um, this revolution is failing or has failed to uh, bear all the fruits that we could have expected in part because modelers pay too little attention to facts. To, uh, to the empirical facts in their modeling efforts. So just ignoring things we know about the world. They view their job as to provide only formal models without anchoring their uh, modeling efforts into what we know about, about science. And I think, um, uh, and I will try to uh, um, illustrate this uh, diagnosis and to respond to possible objection uh, arguing that far from being a, a failing of the formal revolution, that's exactly the way it should be. Uh, but if this diagnosis is right, then I think what we should do is we should complement the formal revolution with an empirical revolution. I think uh, um, 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 people who are interested in uh, doing uh, this formal model should actually uh, be much more interested in anchoring the assumptions and predictions uh, onto what we happen to know about aspects of science. And they can't just uh, overlook them or disregard uh, uh, hundreds of papers and books about uh, the details of science. So it's a call for, uh, in a sense, deepening the formal revolution by making it more relevant to empirical facts. So it is actually genuinely informative about science and not talking about a science that actually does not quite exist and is not the one we are actually in contact with. Um, so that's going to be uh, the, 
uh, goal of of this lecture. And again, some people are really doing that. You know, I don't I don't want I don't want to say that no one is is actually trying to bring the formal modeling in contact with the empirical facts about science. But I do think that it's it's uh, too it's still too rare. And I think what I want to do is to give a small impetus to formal modelers so that they actually deepen uh, their work and make it more relevant. I think for understanding uh, science. I'll start with uh, something that's a really a detour in large part because I was not sure how many slides I had. So I thought maybe I should feel a little bit with some personal stuff that's interesting, it tells you a lot about me. Um, and, and then um, I'll move to, uh, to the, uh, the core issue, the fact that modeler seems to be disregarding fact. And I've, uh, in the original version of this talk, I, had, I wanted to give you a bunch of case studies but in fact, I thought I was actually boring to go through a bunch of models and explain them. So I'll just give you one case study. Uh, uh, and again, it's going to be a bit awkward because it's a paper I really like, I really admire, but I'm going to criticize it all the same. And then I'll move to responses. In many ways, that's the most interesting part of the talk is if you think that in fact, it's actually not quite the job of the formal modelers to care about the empirical facts, uh, what can you respond? to the type of concerns I have. And that's uh, what I will do in the last section of, 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 the, of the talk. The reason I do section one is not simply to fill uh, time, not simply because I have to replace Nick pressure, but it's also uh, because I think what is happening right now in uh, formal modeling is an expression of a, a more general trend in philosophy. And not simply philosophy of science, but more broadly in philosophy, a disregard for facts. And the idea that it does not really quite matter what the facts are. And I think that's a, uh, it's a bad character trait of the philosopher, which is quite widespread throughout philosophy. And I've spent the last 20 years of my life um, uh, 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 pushing against uh, this uh, a bad habit. All right, so I'll start with that. And as you know, one of the things I've done in, uh, in my past life is burn armchairs. Uh, and um, which part of the idea here is that in traditional analytic philosophy, um, there, there are some empirical assumptions that happen to be, or that appear, I should say, to be made and that are never tested. Um, the kind of things that got us started, we experimental philosophers, me and my, uh, uh, associates now 20 years ago was this type of things. And I won't read that, it's just a Frankfurt case. I guess many of you are familiar with that literature in action theory. So you have these weird thought experiments. And then uh, Harry Frankfurt and, uh, says something like, in that case, it seems clear that John's four will be precisely the same moral responsibility and so on and so forth. And the reaction was, it seems clear. To whom? It seems clear to you, it seems clear to me, it seems clear to whom? And how do you know that it seems clear to someone, right? And that, that we took that maybe mistakenly, I, I don't want to, to engage into debate about metaphilosophy here, but we took that to be an empirical commitment about what we are inclined to think about those cases. But it was an empirical commitment that was never assessed, never tested. It was just stated and taken to be obvious. And that, of course, uh, uh, you, know, you don't need to spend a lot of time to find very similar claims and assertions made through philosophy. You know, that's uh, from uh, uh, one of the greatest books of the 20th century uh, philosophy, Sol Kripke's Naming and Necessity. That's one of the famous thought experiments, the Gödel case. And at the end of the case, uh, uh, Kripke says, but it seems to me we are not. We simply are, are not. Again, uh, the, the question for us was, it seems to me, but it seems to your neighbor. Does it seem to someone in Hong Kong? Well, I don't know. Do you know? Uh, and of course, Kripke doesn't know. Uh, now, I should analyze as a very substantial metaphilosophical debate about what this, it seems that means, right? Uh, at the time, we were a little bit naive. We experimental philosophers, as well as the people who were criticizing about what it is we were doing. I think now the quality of the engagement with what we do when we appeal to this, it seems intuitively that has really gotten much deeper and we have a better understanding of the various options. Again, I don't want to engage into the meta philosophy here. What I want to, to say, however, is that 
we got the sense that uh, empirical, that philosophers, analytic philosophers, not philosophers of science, analytic philosophers in ethics, epistemology, philosophy of language, were making empirical assumptions that they were not testing. And so we decided to test them, right? Um, so that's uh, a form of disregard of facts that uh, uh, I think was very, and still is quite common in philosophy. Naturalistic philosophy uh, is, a no, is something quite different from experimental philosophy. It's a very broad and diverse trend in philosophy. It's driven by many ideas and assumptions, but it's in part driven by the idea that some philosophical arguments rely on assumptions that are empirical and not recognized as such or, and not tested. Or some philosophical arguments have uh, uh, um, empirical consequences that are not recognized as such and that are not tested. That's one of the motivations being between, uh, behind being a naturalistic philosopher. That's one of my main motivations. Uh, a place where I've done this kind of work is in moral philosophy, where I've been arguing, and I've been giving examples that facts about moral reasoning and, and or moral judgments and so on and so forth do matter for normative theory in, 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 in ethics, right? That there is no, of course, direct connection. We know we're all aware of the contrast between what's normative and what's empirical, but it is not the case that the two are independent from one another, right? So uh, claims about norms have consequences for claims about facts, and claims about facts have consequences for claims about norms. Um, uh, the consequences are not direct, they're complicated, but they are there nonetheless. So that's what it, mean, what it means to be a naturalistic philosopher. To take seriously the empirical facts in one thinking about the objects of our, of our inquiry. And we feel, I mean, I feel as a naturalistic philosopher that many of the people I'm engaged with who are not naturalistic philosophers just don't care, they disregard the facts. And I think the same is true of uh, history and philosophy of science. And here's a contrast I'd like to draw is between old fashioned, and again, that's someone I really admire and in fact love, uh, you know, it's one of my favorite philosophers to read, uh, Hempel's uh, philosophy, uh, theory, T philosophy of science, which is illustrated by very allusive uh, examples of, of science and actually very commonsensical example of uh, situation with history and philosophy of science where somehow uh, thinking about the same topics, for example, confirmation is grounded in either historical or contemporary facts about, about science. So here, what we have here is again, the same idea between uh, uh, a disregard for facts, the idea that facts can just be ignored, and here facts about how empirical theory happened to be confirmed in science. And the idea that to be resp intellectually responsible when one theorizes about science, one must pay great attention to the details of actual scientific episodes. Either in the past, you know, John's book is replete of examples about history of, drawn from the history of science or about contemporary science. All right. Um, so I think there's a general trend here in philosophy about uh, disregarding facts. And uh, disregarding facts, to disregard for facts is actually multifarious. It takes many forms. You know, in some cases, sometimes just philosophers just stipulate the facts. They just make them up. It's just very easy to, to philosophical literature, just making facts up, not caring at all whether they're, they're true, using their common sense to, to, stipulate, to, to make them up. Sometimes I think that's a bit more insidious. The empirical nature of the claims are not recognized. So empirical claims are made, but they're not recognized as such. And you know, for example, the, uh, the first example I gave you from experimental philosophy, it seems that we are not, not quite obvious that it's an empirical claim, but in fact, it's, it's you know, it has one understanding of what gets to be done there that makes it an empirical claim. And uh, another version is uh, uh, just ignore the relevant empirical facts. I think that's very clear in moral philosophy, where there's been uh, the idea that one can hide behind, hide behind Hume to say that empirical facts about moral, about moral thinking can all be dismissed. But I do think facts matter for philosophy. And I've, the, the reason I, I went to this section was to give you a bunch of examples of the ways there's been, there's been a, a trend to recognize their significance in various ways. And I think it's intellectually, intellectually irresponsible to disregard facts. I think progress, intellectual progress has been made by caring about facts. All right, so that was a bit of an introduction. What I want to do is to move this type of concerns to, what, to, the, to formal modeling in philosophy of science. 
And I, I'm, I'm stating now, and I would be arguing by means of a case study, that uh, modelers in philosophy of science, and to some extent in meta science, I think uh, one can have the same worries about uh, the science of science or meta, what, goes, what goes on under the name meta science. Sometimes, and maybe often, I think we can come back to that in the QA, display a disregard for facts that is very similar to the type of disregard that is found in much of philosophy. Where? Well, pretty much everywhere in the model. Uh, on the assumptions get, that get to be made, you know, the assumptions happen to be false. Uh, by not caring about the implications of the model, the model have empirical implications that are not seriously engaged with, they're not checked against what we know about science. And sometimes in the description of the explanandum, that's an, another way in which uh, empirical assumptions happen not to be either made explicit or sufficiently engaged with. It's not the case, however, that modelers don't engage with science. They do engage with, uh, sorry, with descriptive facts, but it's usually just to motivate their project. So usually a paper by uh, someone who does uh, uh, formal modeling in philosophy of science has this uh, shape. You've got five pages about summarizing without really engaging at any depth with the literature on a given topic. Could be, for example, incentives in science. And then you got five, paper, and it's interchangeable with any other paper on the topic. There's no really no substantial engagement with critical engagement with the literature. It's just to motivate the need for a model. And then you've got 20 pages of modeling, and then you've got two pages of conclusion, which is mentioned. It's plausible. That's the way papers get through. So it's not like there's no engagement with the empirical literature. There is, but it's, it just works as a way to motivate the formal work. Now, I want to. Uh, um, substantiate this criticism by looking at one paper. As I said earlier, I had um, um, somewhat the grand ambition to give you a bunch of case studies for various reasons, including time. Uh, um, I went sledding yesterday with my daughter, you know, so I spent my I spent my uh, my, my day uh, uh, on a hill, getting getting cold and wet instead of uh, uh, looking for more case studies. You can't do everything in life. Uh, so, um, uh, but I have a, a reasonably well worked out example, uh, which in fact was one of the reasons why I, did, I, I foolishly volunteer, volunteered when Nick uh, withdrew his name from the, for today. Okay, so paper uh, is an in-press paper by uh, someone I really admire, uh, Renko Heisen. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing his name well, Heisen? Yeah, Heisen, yeah. Uh, uh, who uh, is uh, forthcoming in uh, BGPS. And the paper is called Cumulative Advantage and the Incentive to Commit Fraud in Science. I should say it's an excellent paper. It's really a very good paper. Actually, it's one of the best papers by Remco um, I've read. I've read quite a few of his papers. And so it's really a really nice, um, really nice piece of work. It's uh, fairly sophisticated. The model is quite sophisticated. The predictions aren't trivial, which is for something I, another beef I have with formal modeling. Uh, it's actually uh, a really nice piece of work. Uh, so I, I, I think I, I haven't chosen it because it's a bad paper. Uh, I've chosen it because I think it's an interesting piece of work. Um, it's also what I'm working on. That's uh, one of the reasons why I've chosen it. All right, the goal of the paper is to explain why fraud and questionable research practices, I, we'll, I'll come back to that a little bit later, fraud and questionable research practices, mm -hmm. So the questionable research practices are those practices that are not fraudulent, but that cause uh, the unreliability of empirical research, right? So a fraud and questionable research practices, why are they common in science? And the reason is well, that many people have given is that because given the reward structure of science, it contributes to academic success. That's one of these many papers that tries to make that claim. It says, uh, a small cottage industry of papers that try to understand this relation between the prevalence of uh, fraud and questionable research practices and academic success, given the reward structure of science. One of many. Um, but this one is actually quite sophisticated. So what I want to do next is uh, describe the model to you um, to some degree of precision. I hope not to butcher it uh, too much. So first thing uh, is an does in his paper is to model the productivity of scientists. And to model the productivity, he represents the production of paper in an interval of time of length two as a, a, a Poisson process. So I looked yesterday at how to say Poisson in 
English, it's a French word, and I stick to the French word, uh, to the French pronunciation. So I stick to Poisson process. A Poisson process has these properties that the distribution of events, uh, 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 K events, within an interval of length uh, 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 two, uh, has a Poisson distribution, right? And lambda here is known as a rate of the Poisson distribution. So higher lambda, the more events you have in a given interval, right? Now, uh, Remco, as that's an important aspect of the model, does not assume that lambda is fixed. Lambda varies as a function of uh, uh, one's eminence, one might say, one's credit. So the idea here is that people who are more eminent, people who have more credit uh, in the credit, credit economy of science have more time to do things. Here's a quotation. I assume that credit buys time and resources directly. So they've got a higher lambda, and because they have a higher lambda, they're more likely to produce more paper in a given interval of time. So far, so good. Uh, uh, how to uh, model credit? Well, the first component of credit is the good papers, which is uh, what little g uh, stands for here. Uh, so your the, uh, credit accumulation rate, so your unit of credit as a function of time, depends on how many paper you have. So that's p here. So the more paper you have, the more credit uh, uh, you get, so also, so, so higher the rate is, uh, uh, and multiplied by a constant C, all right? So far, so good. And the crucial idea here is that um, lambda, which remember measure how many papers you are able to produce in an interval of time, lambda is going to change positively as a function of the, of the credit. Right? Uh, uh, it's a logarithmic function to model diminishing returns. All right. So the idea is, as uh, one writes papers, one's with the number of paper one one has increases, one's credit increases, one's uh, uh, capacity to produce more papers increases. Right. And that's translated by a change in the uh, uh, Poisson process here. A lot of things to be said, a lot of nice bells and whistles in the papers, but I'll spare you. You can read it if you want. And what you have here is just one of the many runs of this idea as a function of time, that's the number of papers that a given scientist happens to make, that's a little dot here. And as you can see, as the, as the scientist uh, uh, publishes paper, she happens to publish more paper. So the interval between following paper diminishes as she publishes more paper, right? That's the, that's the idea that as she publishes more paper, her credit increases because her credit increases, uh, she, she will be able to publish more papers, right? And that's uh, what you see here on the Y axis, that's lambda, right? right? I hope the model is clear so far. The second part of the model is that credit can be negative and credit can be negative because one of us paper can be, uh, can, can be as uh, that the terminology Remco used, exposed. Exposed come under many ways. You can publish a false by accident, a false positive, and your paper can be can be can be replicated. You can have made a mistake, and your paper or you, your theory can fall apart because of, of countervailing evidence. Uh, and that's represented by mu, which is the probability that one of your papers, one of the scientist's papers, will be uh, uh, exposed in this terminology. And so credit is really a function of the good papers, the ones that have not been exposed. And the bad paper, the one which has been exposed, the number of good paper, the number of bad paper. And so lambda is a, lambda is a bit more complicated uh, uh, than that, all right? So you've got some good papers, some bad papers. Now, once you take into account good papers and bad papers, sometimes the productivity of a scientist can have the form we saw earlier with an increasing number of papers, but in some circumstances, it will take a catastrophic turn. Right, depending a little bit on whether you're quite unlucky, a bunch of your papers happens to have been exposed, and then somehow you have more and more negative paper, fewer and fewer, fewer and fewer positive paper, and then, then you end up with a decreasing rate of the of uh, um, uh, publications. All right, so, um, pretty good. So I tell you, it's a very sophisticated model. It's not it's not at all something trivial that you can just see immediately what's going on. It's interesting. Now, the next step is to introduce a contrast between honest and fraudulent papers. So honest papers are papers that don't involve fraud and questionable research practices. Fraudulent papers are papers that are made by means of fraud and questionable research practices. 
And uh, the contrast is that paper which are uh, fraudulent will have a higher impact. And uh, uh, Remco Hazen states, this captures the fact that the letter tend to have higher impact, right? So when you're making a paper by means of questionable research practices or fraud, you're more impactful. However, the risk of being exposed is higher, right? So you're making a paper by frauding, you're more likely to get exposed than if you're making, writing a paper by just collecting your data. And the cost of being exposed is higher when you're cheating than when you're honest, right? Um, so that's the contrast, right? So fraudulent papers are more successful, um, 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 but they are more likely to be exposed. And when they are exposed, you're more pretty. Yeah, Eugene? Yeah, sorry, what's the evidence base for this first Yeah, we'll, we'll come back to the evidence. That's the whole point of the talk. Oh, <laughs> <right>. <laughs> 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 but yes, uh, um, yes, that's that's actually. Uh, I, I won't talk about this one. But that's something, of course, that could have been could have been discussed here. All right. The last idea, which has been, you know, it's 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 an important idea mm -hmm. that is quite, you know, if you know evolutionary biology, you, you, you should be familiar with that idea. It's a very important one. So you can have a process mm -hmm. that have a lower expectation than another process. But when you introduce a selective filter, the first process in, in payoff, in some payoff, in lower expectation is some payoff. But you, when you introduce a selective filter, the first process is more likely to be represented as the next generation than the second process. Why is that? When, it, when can it happen? When the first process increase, increases the variance, right? Uh, so just think about that. To get tenure at Harvard, you must be really, 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 really good. Or you must look to be really good. Um, and uh, people who are honest, somehow their goodness range might actually be a little bit limited to be above this uh, threshold. People who do fraudulent work, their uh, uh, apparent goodness range might be much larger. So if you introduce a selective filter like tenure, then people at Harvard might be more fraudulent people might be more likely to, to pass this, um, this um, uh, threshold. Even so, the expectation is, is that fraudulent people will do on average less well than, uh, than uh, honest people. So that's, that's a very important idea if you think about evolution. Evolution sometimes works just this way, right? And, and here we have taking this idea. So there, and uh, uh, um, um, fraudulent research, uh, uh, he's is right to notice that's one of the interesting aspects of the paper, uh, uh, in fact, can help uh, scientists go over thresholds, uh, credit thresholds, even so the expectation is lower. Okay, that, as I said, it's a good paper. All right. The upshot? Uh, uh, well, the upshot is two. He then gives us a simulation. The simulation is a little bit, I don't, I don't want to, okay. Um, the simulation is interesting and shows that there's always a range of values such that a boss for the expectation and for moving, passing some, some threshold, uh, you are going to be better if you are a fraudulent uh, researcher. So what he does is set some values to the parameter and then changes uh, the credit one gets when one is, is doing fraudulent research to the credit one gets when one is doing honest research. And then he measures a proportion of, uh, fraudulent, of uh, fraudulent researchers. And then he, he proves the following theorem um, that uh, for uh, all the values of the other parameters, there's always a value of uh, the benefit one gets from doing fraudulent research, such that in expectation and belong some threshold, uh, there, uh, you're better off being a fraudulent researcher. When one thing about it, not very surprising. <laughs> I mean, obviously, there must be a value such that, you know, just put the credit at 1 million. I mean, come on. I mean, I mean the existence proof is obviously not very surprising. Uh, it's obvious. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, I'll, I'll bracket this, this small point here. But yeah, uh, in any case. All right. Now, that was the introduction of the paper. What I want to do now is uh, very quickly highlight the fact, I think that's a great paper. I think it's, it's very ingenious, it's sophisticated. Um, um, but what I want to, to, to show is that 
it's making empirical assumptions and not dealing with the empirical implications of the paper the way it should be. And there are many ways. I mean, Eugene just pointed out one, but there are many places. And uh, Heeson is actually very clear. He is not is not uh, uh, ignoring the empirical fact. He's actually flagging them out. You know, it's, it's really a good, good philosophy of science. He's flagging them out as being empirical facts. Uh, he's, however, just not uh, engaging with them at the, what I take to be the required or the responsible degree of depth. So here's the one I will be focusing on, one is a modeling assumption. The idea is that when your paper has been exposed, you get some negative credit. And he then does not do anything to justify this empirical assumption. And it's very obvious why he doesn't do anything because it's very commonsensical. You take the cookie from the jar, your father sees you or your mother sees you, your parent sees you, he or she slaps your hand. It's very commonsensical, right? You get caught doing something bad, you get exposed, you get, you get punishment. But is that true? On second, on, on, on second thought, is that true that the, uh, uh, distribution of credit in science is such that people who are exposed get actually negative credit. Well, here's the answer is actually much more complicated than what uh, he's uh, is suggesting in his paper. It's more complicated in two ways. The first one is, is uh, well, it's, it's more complicated in part because it depends on whether you're frauding or doing questionable research practices. And you can't just treat the, the two identically. The dynamics for credit are extremely different. If you're frauding, what he says is true. If you're caught frauding, uh, odds are for most people that you're going to get severely punished. However, if, you're, if, you're, if, if your paper failed to replicate because of questionable research practices, the empirical evidence suggests there's no cost for you, no cost whatsoever. There's a bunch of, of, of uh, recent studies of citation of failed replication suggesting that a failed replication has no impact on the citation level of the failed paper. Your paper is cited as much and at the same rate as if it had not been falsified. Now, it's an interesting question, why? Uh, one might think that the distribution of information in science is actually, exactly, uh, I'm not sure how to put it well, but I think it says something about how information gets to be spread within a network of, a network of scientists. Right. Um, uh, in any case, that fact is quite at odds for this one, not for fraud again, but for questionable research, research practice. And the paper, despite the title, is not about fraud. It's about questionable research practices and fraud, and it's connected to the replication crisis. And furthermore, it does not simply depend on fraud versus questionable research practice. It depends on the attitude of the person whose work has been exposed. If you're a scientist, whose work is exposed and you come forward and say, oh yeah, I made a mistake. The penalty for credit are extremely limited. People don't get punished for, do, for doing, doing science that does not replicate. Even if they engage in questionable research practices, uh, they do get punished by doing science that, and doing, engaging questionable research practices and sticking to their grounds uh, by being stubborn. <laughs> That's when people get really punished. Uh, being honest actually, uh, allows you to uh, uh, wash your sins in, uh, in, in the credit economy of, of science. So what we have here is that this very simple idea, this very commonsensical idea is in fact at odds with what we know about how credit gets to be assigned when a piece of science gets to be uh, exposed to use um, uh, uh, his own terminology. The second place where uh, I want to focus on is the implications. And here's a contrast between, as between being at Harvard and being at Lake Summers State College. No offense to a Lake Summers State College faculty and students, but the fact is getting tenure at Harvard is much harder than getting tenure at Lake Summers State College. So the credit threshold that, mean, that must be met is much higher. And he then is fully aware, it's, it's a really good paper. I mean, really, it's very thoughtful. He has thought about a lot of things. He then is fully aware that if that's true, then you, find, you should find more fraudulent on scientists at Harvard than at um, Lake Summer State College. Is that true? Well, again, here he's on, he's, he's doing some, some attempt. He says, well, it's difficult to test. And then he's alluding to a paper by Strober and Kulik that focus, however, just on fraud. And indeed, I think there's a lot of things to say about that paper, but I won't engage there. 
But what I want to, to say is, is that really that difficult to test? It really takes me like five minutes to think about how to test it. And in fact, it's been tested. It's been tested by papers that has just been published, but it's been around on, on the internet for now years. Uh, you know, I've read it like five years ago or four years ago. That shows that there is no relation between replicability and the edge index. So people who are more people who are much more successful, right? They've had much more impact, much better impact on science, are not more likely to uh, be uh, to do research as unreplic unreplicable, contrary to what his model would actually lead us to predict. And again, it's not very difficult to test that. It's mm -hmm. obvious how how that could be tested, and it has already been done. So that's what I mean here by disregarding by disregarding the facts, right? So there's a striking implications of the model, something really exciting, almost a, a, an experiment, to, uh, you know, a crucial experiment, something like that. And and instead of really engaging with that with that thing, he just gives, throw a citation and just move on to the conclusion of the paper. Time for facts. Um, all right. So that's that's uh, was the case study. And again. Uh, let me let me just repeat. Uh, it's a great paper. It's really, I think, you know, one of the best papers I've read on the topic. It's very sophisticated. It's very thoughtful about the consequences of the model. It really flags out the empirical assumption as such. So it's 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 really not trying to uh, to muddle or to uh, to to mislead the reader in any possible way. But I do think it embodies uh, uh, the disregard for facts. Mel, you have a question, but I suggest you keep it for the Q and A because um, I'm, I have seven minutes and I want to be done. Um, all right, objections and responses. I'll go very quickly, even so, uh, I think that in many ways, the most interesting part, the one that, but also the most underdeveloped at this point. Objection one, I'm putting in the shoes of someone who uh, uh, is doing this formal, this formal work and wants to respond to this type of, of criticism. And the first thing that person should say is that, well, your case study is not representative. That person should say, well, some models, some models might in some respects disregard relevant facts, most don't. A variant of this objection is that the best models don't do that. I'm, not, I'm going to ignore the variant. I think uh, we, uh, Heisen's model is actually a very good piece of work. So I'm going to just dismiss, uh, dismiss this variant. Um, what I just want to say, uh, first, I should concede that I haven't shown, even remotely shown, that most models disregard, most modelers disregard the fact. I've given you one case study. But I think I've read quite a bit of that. Uh, and I'm reasonably confident that uh, a disregard for fact is actually quite, quite, quite not universal, far from it, but quite widespread in, in, this, in this literature. Uh, again, the, you know, I, can't, I can't prove it now, but uh, if I move forward with this project, I'll, I'll, I'll do more of that. A second objection, one which is more interesting, is that, look, I'm misunderstanding the whole point of this modeling. I'm just confused. The, uh, the whole point of the modeling is not to provide an explanation of a given phenomenon. It's to provide a possible explanation, as philosophers like to say, how possible the explanation. Now, that's uh, an, uh, an objection that my critics are very likely to make, because they make it in print. Uh, you know, uh, um, uh, so uh, Kellyn, for example, in one of our recent papers, based on uh, Smaldino and McElrath's model, has a long section of the conclusion where she discusses this kind of idea. OK, so how possibly explanations? It doesn't really matter that much if they are not grounded in what we know about the process, because they're not supposed to tell us how things actually, what actually explains the phenomena. They are just supposed to tell us what could have explained the phenomenon, or what could explain the phenomenon. The first thing to be said is that the modelers speak from two sides of the mouse at the same time, which is difficult. Uh, at the same time, they say, look, it's just a, a, a possible explanation. But on the other hand, they want something more. They have loftier ambitions. And they're careful, but they do have loftier ambitions. They say, for example, that the model is suggestive, right? Uh, so it's at least meant to tell us something, not, not, not decisively. You know, our confidence should be pro well proportioned. But it should tell us something about what actually happens, right? So, and I think it's not an accident that they have more grand, grander ambitions. It's because how possibly explanations really have a limited interest. Uh, they're interesting in a limited range of contexts. Here's one context where how possibly explanations are very interesting when they seem to, when they show that what you took antecedently to be 
incompatible with a theory, with a theory, inconsistent with a theory, happen to be consistent with that theory. Well, that's correct. And uh, you know, the work on biological altruism is exactly that kind. It does not quite matter whether it describes uh, the evolution of biological altruism. What matters is that it shows that biological altruism is not incompatible with evolution by natural selection. Uh, so the facts there don't matter too much, but that's not what we're talking about there. Another type of situation where how possible explanations are relevant is when they are partially justified. They're just explanation sketches. Uh, some of it is well grounded in the evidence, some of it is just speculative, right? And that's totally justified. Uh, that's, I think, the closest to what we're talking about there. I think that's probably the fairest description. Uh, but, I, but I actually, uh, you know, I, I think it would be very a bare bone sketch if that's going to count as, as a sketch. What's more, how possibly but unlikely models, models that involve false assumptions and falsified implications are really of little value. You know, uh, it's one thing to say my model is partially justified. It's another one to say my model is partially falsified. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, and I think most of the models we're dealing with, uh, some of the models we're dealing with are partially falsified. Okay, objection three. Uh, again, I'm confused. I'm just misunderstanding the rule of the game. Uh, the, point, the point of formal models is not to really understand actual phenomena targets of explanation. It's much more likely to understand what follows from a set of assumptions. They are rigorous in, in addition, while variable models, which do the same type of things, you know, connect assumptions to consequences, are lack rigor. I think that's true. Uh, variable models often lack rigor because we are taking your common sense to connect the, uh, the assumptions to the conclusion. I think that's totally true. Uh, I mean, you know, modelers like uh, Rob Boyd has said that for like 45, 50 years now. So um, I think that's uh, totally true. On the other hand, What's the point of examining the relation between assumptions and consequences if you don't bring them to bear on empirical phenomena? Yeah. I mean, I, 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 what's the point of having tons of is then relation? You know, uh, you know, why not play, play, play Scrabble or whatever? You know? I mean, you know, the point of doing science is to understand empirical phenomena, not, not to map a space of relation between assumptions and, and consequences. And indeed, it's not an accident. I think that models are usually more ambitious. Objection four, division of labor. Philosophers theorize, empirical scientists test. No one's going to blame, for example, string theorists for not... David, put, I pretend you're not here, okay? Because <laughs> I'm talking about physics. <laughs> uh, uh, no one's going to blame string theorists for just developing uh, 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 speculative models. Um, uh, that's not their job to test, uh, to test them, right? The job to test them is the empirical physicist who is going to bring those models when that's possible in contact with the fact. That's totally, totally reasonable objection. So it's not a criticism to his own to say that he's not testing his model. That's not his job. He's the philosophical equivalent of a string theorist. Whether that's a compliment or not, depend on your view on, about string theory. Um, I think that would be nice if they were empirical philosophers, but this division of labor just doesn't exist in philosophy. <laughs> so you can't just allude to, 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 the, to the model of physics. There is no division of labor in philosophy. No one tests a formal model. What's more, again, modelers are love to have loftier ambition. They're just not happy to tell us, here's a theory. Maybe it's true, maybe it's false. That's not the way they're describing their own work, never. Objection five. Uh, I got this one from uh, Kevin Zolman, who emailed me. Uh, the empirical side of, is underdeveloped or unreliable. Facts are not disregarded. I'm actually misdescribing the situation. Reliable empirical information just is unavailable to test the model. Response? Not true. You know, I think the consequences of a Heisen's model is very easily tested. Not, not tested to the point where the model can be rejected once and for all. But there is relevant evidence out there that bears on whether we should take the model as being a good description of why fraud and questionable research practices are common in some parts of science. Objection six, uh, one which I'm sure has crossed your mind as philosophers of science, is that, um, I'm, again, I'm just confused. What I take to be a disregard for facts is merely the process of idealization, which is an appropriate part of, my model, of any modeling effort. So for example, I criticized um, uh, Heeson, you might remember, 
uh, pointed out that that Heisen was uh, uh, asserting that uh, um, the expo exposure of one's papers led to negative credit. And I was arguing that, uh, look, it does seem that it depends whether you're frauding or engaging in questionable research practices. It does not seem to be true for questionable research practices. And what's more, it depends on the attitude of the scientist whose paper has been exposed. Here, he's on my response. Maybe look, well, all that is true. I'm just making an idealization here. I'm idealizing aware from the complexity and messiness of the actual world. Which I will respond, I will respond. Some idealizations are justified, others are not. You can't just appeal to idealization as if that, as if that gives you a, a blanket to do anything when you're modeling. It's just not the way idealization works in any respectable science. I, some idealizations are good, others are bad. And uh, you can't just do whatever you want by ignoring the facts. All right. Uh, oh, here's a paper meal I wanted to mention earlier. All right, so that, 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 that's it. Uh, um, so the worry here, as I said, I mean, I, I really admire the work that's been done in formal modeling philosophy of science. I think that's really one of the most exciting developments in, in philosophy uh, of science over the last 20 years. I also think that uh, sometimes some papers feel um, like a machine that gets to be run and without enough traction, without enough a friction uh, with, with the real world. Uh, and in a sense, the point of this talk is actually to uh, push my uh, friends and people I really admire to move away from the paper mill and to engage with, uh, uh, I think, greater depth and, and actually more responsibility, intellectual responsibility, with what we actually know about science, sociology of science, history of science, and so on and so forth. So it's time to get real. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> All right, so, oh, Mr. Minister. So I will do two things. I will uh, call the stuff and I will also, and I will also, uh, uh, okay. All right, Heza, we'll start with you. Okay, so thank you, that was super fun. Um, I wanted to ask a question about information and where, where you get it. So, for example, when you talk about fraud versus questionable research practices, and you said, like, there's no punishment in citation tasks for questionable research practices. But you didn't give us the evidence that there are decreased citation tasks for papers that are known to be fraud. Right? Um, so, I want to know where we should go to find the facts we need. Yes, uh, it's um, it's uh, not an easy uh, question. I mean, after all, no one can know everything. I mean, I mean, it's true. I mean, it takes a lot of time to develop these models. You know, it takes actually a lot of so sophistication, sometimes mathematical sophistication, writing them in a way that's clear and understandable by people who don't have the mathematical sophistication is actually not a trivial effort. Um, so, so it is true that. Um, it's, it's, it might be uh, unfair maybe, um, or maybe ask, expecting too much and hence maybe unfair to ask someone to both do on a sense of formal work, the exposure, the exposition work and know where to search, right? So not if you know the facts, uh, no one would know the fact, but at least know where to search, which itself is not trivial, a trivial piece of, of, of knowledge, right? Um, I, I think that that is a good, Good point. Uh, maybe it does speak for doing more inter inter collaborative work, right? Maybe this kind of work should be sought as um, involving both on people who are more versed in the empirical literature. I mean, I'm reasonably versed in that empirical literature anyway, uh, and people who are more versed in the formal modeling. So more collaboration to bring um, to bring. Uh, uh, Complementary expert ex, uh, domains of expertise, right? Um, now it's, it's goes very much against philosophy, uh, against the philosophical ethos, and of, of course one might think against the credit economy of philosophy as well. Um, so maybe the yeah. Uh, I, I also was just asking for practical advice, like where do you go to find the, the facts of the cases? Is there like particular? I mean, the tax and watch is great for the cases as well, but. 
Um, do you have a go-to place? No, I don't have a go-to okay. place. I, I follow, you know, I, 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 uh, I'm not an active Twitterer. Uh, I'm a passive Twitterer in the sense I have an account there. And I follow people who spend a lot of time um, 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 advertising papers, not only their own papers, but papers. And uh, I systematically download them and I've got infinite folders full of unread PDFs, <laughs> like, many, like, like many of us. Uh, um, but yes, it's, it, unfortunately, there is no, uh, no obvious. Um, I've done a little bit of work on citation in fraud. I didn't, for the sake of time, I didn't mention it. The situation is better for fraud. Uh, you can actually show very quickly that within three, four years, the citation rates of at least the most well-known fraudulent cases really go down quickly. They don't disappear entirely. You know, people sometimes 15 years after a fraud has been revealed, some papers are still positively cited in the literature, for example, in meta-analysis. But that's, that's more the exception than the rule. Uh, and I think the contrast with questionable research practices here is quite striking because now those papers are 10 years old. I think that's enough in principle, at least for a fraudulent paper to go down. Um, so, yeah, that's an interesting contrast. Yeah. David? What did you try as a qualified defense? Um, Good. For your case study. I mean, these are the reading I got. This, this is a, a plausible interesting hypothesis being developed from the main verbal version sharp enough to make contradictions. Mm -hmm. The authors made some of the check contradictions and the checks they've made but they're not they're not sufficiently aware of some of the literature. So in fact, there's other literature mm -hmm. that um, that's more or less falsifies stuff. That all sounds to me great. I mean, there's there's now a window for a short paper to write that it's about two pages long, <laughs> saying nice things about the model and pointing out that one of the virtues of the model is the sharp critical makes a demonstrated prediction appears to be um, at least to the attention of some empirical data here to set issue. In principle, that all sounds fun. I mean, one concern I have is that uh, if we want to be doing computer formal models that way, our own publication economy needs to recognize that that paper counts, that, that hypothetical paper counts as, a, counts as a philosophy paper, and indeed a philosophy paper that's better be published by the journal the, the first result appears. But that seems to be a sort of a broader question about how, how we manage the flow of the data in. It doesn't seem doesn't seem problematic to me. For, right. Uh, for, if we have formal modeling that makes good faith but successful attempts to study literature. Good, good. Um, I mean, that's in many ways an ideal situation where we do have um, uh, people who bring. I, I, I thought about collaboration, but it's, an, it's another way in which we can have friction with, with, between people with expertise in somehow what one might call some of the empirical facts and people with greater expertise in uh, the modeling part of, of, of uh, the intellectual enterprise. Um, it's not collaborative, it's confrontational, but in a sense, you, you, you would get the same, the, same, the same benefits. Now, the worry, of course, is that that's not the way things are done. And it's just not the way things can be done for, for at least two reasons. The first one is that there's really a lot of models out there. You know, a um, lot of models get published in philosophy of science, uh, in a bunch of journals. And I don't think anyone has the time or the inclination to literally go read the models, look at the possible predictions, be sufficiently informed to, to test them. And the second issue uh, is uh, the one you alluded, I think, at the end, is in terms of credit. It's not simply is that philosophy or not. It's also uh, how much credit do you get by writing this two-page paper? Uh, I, I, you know, I, I could write it. I'm not sure I will. Uh, I mean, it might be part of another project. Um, but is that worth my, my, my time? It might be worth intellectually. It might be an interesting contribution. Maybe he then will have things to, to respond. And maybe it's going, might be actually a fruitful exchange between the two of us. But in terms of, of the credit I would get for that, I'm not sure it's worth my time. Uh, you know, responses, two-page responses with a lot of empirical facts don't get, they don't get traction, they don't get cited, people don't pay too much attention to them. So I do worry a little bit that, um, yes, what we, you know, both uh, the collaboration idea and the con confrontation are just both ways to bring people with complementary expertise in contact to one another. 
and to ad address maybe, uh, um, you know, uh, it's not a disregard of facts, it's just with dividing or subversion of the division of labor in some way. Um, it's just not really happening, and uh, for good reason. So, I mean, let, let me try and modification okay. the critique in that framework. It sounds like, and that would be part of the critique that comes to this. Insofar as models are actually being presented as empirical hypotheses and not just possibly, mm -hmm. it's irresponsible to do that sort of work in an ecosystem right. in which empirical hypotheses are not adequately checked out. That's right. So, you, if you're going to do that work at all, there's a really high burden on you to really thoroughly engage in here and a much higher burden than we might recognize in other areas where the ecosystem. That's right. Either, either yourself or find people who might want to do it with you or find ways to, uh, to, to do it. Yeah, I think, I think that, I, I, really like the way, I really like the way you're putting it, actually. So, Edin and then Sheffield and then Men. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Edward. Uh, several concise comments. Uh, first, I think it's important, uh, a really well considered argument that uh, as a member of this modeling community, uh, happily, all the folks that All my objections were addressed. And uh, I, <laughs> I hope that uh, you do publish the paper. I uh, think even uh, a workshop conference would be a, a way to direct folks who are doing the work uh, that I find enormously valuable or more productive and practical. These sorts of pieces with more confident uh, understanding of the empirical facts that are relevant. that empirical, I also appreciate the effect of that a really excellent piece by Remco, rather than that they're, they're much worse oh, yeah. than one percent. Okay. And then making our objective a, a demonstration of great height mm -hmm. uh, against a really good example. So, so thank you. Yes. And uh, I hope we. Thanks. <laughs> it's very nice of you. <laughs> I have a follow up to objection six. As you were going through your talk, that would that would work from my mind. And like one could say, well, we have to do abstract design calculations. That's how we get the goal to require at least that's what that's what scientists would say. Economists might say, well, we have to ignore inflation for now and get to um, do they not provide that discussion in these no, they do. They do. I mean, uh, as if you know, they're philosophers of science, so they're fully aware of what modeling looks like. Uh, I mean, I mentioned the paper by Kelly O'Connor earlier, and she has a discussion of that in the conclusion of her paper. It's often presented in the context of simple models, you know, explaining why the models are simple, why they don't build in more assumptions than they do. Um, um, yeah, so they're, they're fully aware of, of uh, that, but they don't really engage with the question about which just if which uh, idealizations are justified when, uh, which I think is the crux of the matter, right? Um, I mean, it strikes me that it could be issued. We have to say, well, this is our this is the particular goal, and this is why we are idealizing it. Because this is the particular goal. Yeah, but I mean, it's just to be a good reason, right? I mean, I mean, you know, you look at the negative part of uh, Heisen's model. Um, and what he could do is just limit the model to fraud, where the claims I think are much more plausible than to an extent questionable research practices. Now, then it removes some of the motivation of the paper because the paper is set within the context of the replication crisis. And no one thinks fraud is the reason why we are dealing with fully replicable uh, parts of science. It's just not the case. Um, um, now, so one thing he could do could limit it to fraud. He, he could appeal to idealization. But the worry is that the dynamic, that's not the kind of things we can idealize away because the dynamics of credit is just aren't the same when it comes to questionable research practices and fraud. They just work very differently. So you can't just pretend, oh, it's, it's, it's like friction. Uh, no, it's not like friction. The dynamics are just dramatically changed when you draw the distinction, I think anyway. It appears anyway, based on these uh, few papers that I've cited.
no, I, no, it needs more papers need to be cited in an exam. In, you know, I, but let's see, yes, okay, male and then yeah, Angela. Um, this is the model of the problem, of the and it's precisely in that these models, a lot of these models, these models of these designs can be written like science, like something that's going to produce knowledge of the world. And it's, I think, explicitly uh, set up to look like that, like mm -hmm. set up to, to give us a sense that this is a, is a scientific effort and that it's giving us facts, right? But it's not coordinating in the right way with the results of the measurement procedure. And this is also mm -hmm. my concern, right? This is my concern with like the game theory stuff and a lot of the meta science stuff or the from modern social science, but also with the, the particular purchasing of natural energy stuff is that we we've got this, you know, uh, is it also this is the heart uh, of it, it being a knowledge production procedure is that's what I'm thinking. No, I agree. I mean, the issue, of course, is not limited to this um, area of, of science. I, uh, it's, a, it's a much broader concern uh, of uh, modeling for its own sake is, uh, is a vice of some parts of science. It's, it's actually an issue in some parts of meta science as well. And I, I don't think there's actually a very sharp distinction between meta science and that tradition because of your science. I think the two are uh, nicely and seamlessly continuous. And I think that's a positive thing, not, not, not a negative thing. I think it's great for philosophy of science to be continuous to uh, to meta science. Uh, um, so yes, you're quite right. The issue is not limited to this area. It's a broader it's a broader concern, but it is also an issue for for, for this area. And that's what I wanted to uh, to point out. Yeah, I, I just want to respond that that's where the logic of comes in mm. is is that we're, we're, it's a dishonest signal. I, 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 I don't think I would want to put it in terms of, of lack of, of good of, of good faith. I, I definitely don't think people like Okono and Heizen and just people lack lack good faith. I think mm -hmm. I think it's it, you know it much much better. I mean, maybe a better explanation is one that appeals to uh, to to the boundedness of everyone's knowledge. And you know, we, we literally can't do can't do everything, and there mm -hmm. must be we must find. Probably institutional institution institutional ways for the required friction to happen. Uh, um, uh, it, so I, I wouldn't want to say uh, that no, it, it's it's not like no, I do think there's a reality about the paper mean, right? You know, it, it, I think that's a real phenomenon. But but it's not necessarily because people have bad faith. It's um, uh, it's because they can't do everything. Uh, yeah. I mean, I have like the my Eugene and then uh, and then Eddie. Eugene, go for it. Oh, John is here. Super, super sympathetic to the general process. I have a kind of question about the level at which case studies should be most helpful. So, um, successful examples of modeling in cognitive science typically involve models that are, as we pointed out, partially justified if they are used as tools, devices which are a few predictions. And it's hardly ever regarded as a problem that some of the assumptions aren't tested just yet, right? So, the pathology. But I think you are driving that does not seem to come out at the level of the individual paper, but rather at the level of the whole research dynamic spanning an entire debate. Yeah. Where certain things just they never get checked up on. And so I was wondering whether the right way to go about this would be to look at several individual papers, or rather to try from the start to contrast positive with what well, successful with previous cases and look at dynamics across. Well, I suspect what you'll find in the cases that you're referring to that, oh well, things just don't get followed up. Right? Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Uh, the issue is, I think, I think I agree with what you said, that the issue really concerned um, 
uh, discipline wide or a tradition wide white 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 pattern rather than individual individual papers i mean the, the point of having many case studies was to try to make by induction one might say uh, uh, to say something about the whole the whole field that people don't really go on and check their models and not not simply them there but no one really goes on and check checks check the model uh, but but yeah, so I I I, I agree with with the speech. I'm not exactly sure to see what the positive proposal looks like looking at two different dynamics. But we can talk a bit about that. Uh, well, well, look, uh, there's, there's perhaps complexity, not exciting, but empirical is possible. Um, yeah, I track exercises which are reasonably successful at predicting how um, our movements are being influenced by. Right, that, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. No, I, no. What I, what I had in mind is I'm not exactly sure how I would go on to demonstrate the contrast. Um, I'm not yet what the tools I would have to do. But we can talk a bit more a bit more about that. What I mean, we have eight minutes. There are plenty of people online. So, Eddie, if you don't mind, I'm going to go into it. John. Yeah. Uh, yeah. John. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. Um, I want to say that I share your ambivalence in this literature. I have both sides. Uh, the experience of hearing a talk and you know, that that does some sort of modeling is, is typically really quite a wonderful experience. I mean, I really love the talks. Uh, the high point is typically some moment where there's a simulation that's displayed and you see the colored dots move around and the process happens the way as expected or some curve goes in the way that you like. And you walk out of the talk, you know, elated saying, wow, that was just great. But then, then the ambivalence kicks in. Then, then what I say to myself is, look, what I've just learned is that some unexpected combination of variables or some variable that I hadn't thought about turns out to have some controlling influence on a process in a way that I didn't expect. I mean, if that, if that doesn't happen, the talk was a bit of a dud, right? But then I start to worry, well, what other parameters, what other variables, what other ranges have been neglected? Right? I mean, I understand the effect. Uh, and, and now there's a dynamic here that is not very effective. So the dynamic is to say, I think pretty hard about it. And I say, okay, what about variable X? Maybe it goes the other way, right? Now you, you did this, you said, what about um, uh, what happens to someone who commits fraud? Uh, it doesn't seem to harm them as, as, as much as you said. Now you feel like you've, you've somehow provided a corrective, but you haven't addressed the key worry because what now happens is that the modeler says, ah, oh, no problem, I'll change the variable, I'll, I'll add a new variable. Are you happy now? Right? Because the, the, worry, the worry is not the variable that I can see, it's the variable that I can't see. It's the effect that I can't see. We're dealing with very complicated human systems here. Uh, and we're dealing with processes that vary over time. Even just the simple case of academic credit, it's changing rapidly with the impact of the internet. I don't know that what happened five or 10 years ago is anything like what's going to be uh, relevant now or even five or 10 years uh, into the future. So um, my sense is repeatedly that there's, there's a, an illicit shifting of the, uh, of the burden of proof. The talk's given, the process is demonstrated, you're not satisfied. And the response is, prove me wrong. And that's the wrong, that's the wrong response. It should be, I'll prove I'm right. And that's the thing that leaves me very, uh, very concerned. I don't know how, how you could do that, given the complexity of the systems. Yeah, so that's a different uh, type of concern than the one I have. It's not un unrelated, but that's a different one. It's more focusing on the simplicity of the model and the obvious need to, uh, to bracket if, you know, there's a known known, oh, sorry, there's a known unknown, so the brackets of variables that you actually know might be relevant, but there's also the unknown unknown, you know, what you refer to the greatest philosopher of science ever. Um, and, uh, but th and that's the one you really have, have in mind. Um, I think that's a very serious issue. I mean, that's a serious issue for any modeling efforts, right? Um, you know, in, in that respect, I don't think philosophers of science are on a different boat from economists, from anyone else, right? Um, you know, I, I, I do think in the, um, what I diagnose as diagnosing 
disregarding facts, I think that's somewhat more pronounced in philosophy of science and in other parts. Uh, and because I, you know, I think that's a philosophical bad habit. Uh, so, so yes, I mean, I, I think the, the modeling effort is, can be a attack might not be the right word or discussed maybe to put it in a friendly manner from, from many angles. And I, and I, I agree. I, I agree with you. The example, like the criticism I gave of, uh, of his can be can be put, can be, can be cast along your lines. You know, here's a, here's a relevant variable, fraud versus questionable research practices. Now that's a relevant variable that uh, uh, his is not, is not taking into account. And that's one that matters for his, I think should matter for his models, right? So, uh, so, so yes, uh, but then it's unclear how easy it's going to be built into the model, right? You know, at some point, models that are simple become very complicated and hard to manage. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just sympathetic. I just think it's a much broader concern than even broader concern than the one I have. Um, Tim? Tim? Hello. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I, I love this topic and I try to work on it a little bit myself. So the question I have for you is how can we make our demand for um, some engagement with empirical facts more precise while also keeping it general. Um, and I think we need to make it more precise in order to prevent something that is already beginning to happen where uh, empirical work is being done in order to um, support these models in a way that is not quite satisfying to us. And my example is uh, game theoretic models of academic collaboration that use the Nash demand game. Um, and then there's a body of literature on something called the cultural red king effect It's not super important, but uh, what they've done is they've done a study where human subjects play the national amount game. And then they see that their own models that use um, evolutionary game theory are good models of humans playing the national amount game. So if we just say we want some sort of empirical facts, they can now say, well, look, we did the study. Now we have empirical results, but the problem isn't uh, the problem isn't whether the models are good models of the Nash demand game. The problem is whether the Nash demand game has anything to do with how academic collaborations work, right? So I think we need to make uh, sure that we can um, make a very precise demand uh, and make sure that sort of the hardest, the hardest part of this this problem between the models and the target systems um, is is sort of in focus in our demand in order to prevent some sort of I mean, it would be unfair to call it deflection, but I think it is easy to do uh, empirical work that is um, that that addresses some of the concerns, but not sort of the most worrying parts of the problem. You know, I I, I think that's 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 a good point, it's a complementary point to one I, to the one I've made earlier, and I could also give you some other example. Uh, but I don't want, I, I've named enough names today. Uh, so, you know, so I, I could give you more example of, of the type of concerns you have where some, some empirical work happens to be done in meta science. That's definitely interesting and definitely related, but does not seem to be addressing the core empirical assumptions that should, that, 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 that should, should be tested. Um, so yeah, so I think this is absolutely right. That's, a, that's an, an aspect of the debate I hadn't really engaged with, the nature of the relevant empirical evidence to test the empirical assumptions or consequences that happen to be made. So that's something I should have paid more attention to. Thanks. Um, we have time for one last question and then we'll stop. Richard? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Edor. Uh, very interesting talk. Um, uncertainty in data gathering, gathering and data modeling is a given in large transdisciplinary driven research. For example, climate risk management geosciences coming together with the geographical sciences, economics, social sciences all get thrown into the mix. My question is, is identifying the uncertainty a plus or a minus? Um, and in particular, one of my concerns as a science educator is the general public has a very different understanding of the term of uncertainty than the scientists do. You yeah, know, that's a, um, uh, it's a broader question. It's a very important question uh, in the context of science communication, which is uh, in, in a way what, what you have in mind here. Communicating the nature of uncertainty is extremely difficult. As, as there's also a sense that we, you know, scientists live in uncertainty and often are fully aware of the limitations, both of their data and of their models. 
but uncertainty is taken by um, lay people to be a weakness, to be something that disqualify uh, the claim, the claim to knowledge. I think there's good, good psychological reason why uncertainty happens to be treated very differently by lay people than they are by practitioners in science. Um, you know, I think in, in everyday life, when you say you're uncertain, you can't make a claim to knowledge. So uncertainty is taken to defeat uh, your, uh, your claim to knowledge in many, in many everyday circumstances. And I think that's the reason why lay people, when they hear about the uncertainty both of the scientific data and of the modeling process, uh, are, are inclined to disqualify the claims of scientists to, to be knowledgeable with respect to something. How to do it well is something I don't really know. Um, communicating uncertainty, we, you, you can't really lie to people because people end up knowing about it. You know, they, end up, they end up knowing that the models are actually uncertain. Uh, but communicating uh, uh, the model in the right way, uh, I think has been and remains an enormous challenge for, uh, for, for scientists and science communicators. I don't really have any uh, great insight about how, how we can do it, uh, but I, I do acknowledge that it's an enormous challenge. All right, thank you very much for, for joining us. And I think we will uh, stop here for today because we always stop at about 1.30. Thanks guys.